Well, a big welcome to our nephew community. My name is Sean George, Medical Science Director with Otsuka. I'll be serving as your host for today's podcast. If you're a first-time listener on this podcast, we're so happy to have you. Our mission at NEPHEW is to improve the future outcomes for individuals with kidney disease and other related conditions. For our returning listeners, thank you for tuning back in and listening to another episode today. I'm very excited about our topic today as we will be discussing current trends in home dialysis. To share his expertise with us, we have Dr. Ankur Shah. Dr. Shah is no stranger to this podcast channel. He is an assistant professor of medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, where he is the associate program director of the Nephrology Fellowship. He completed his residency at Temple University Hospital, followed by a fellowship at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where he served as chief fellow. His primary clinical interests are peritoneal dialysis, home hemodialysis, and medical education. Dr. Shaw, we're so glad to have you back for another episode. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, we know home dialysis remains a hot topic in the nephrology community, and uh, the overall population of ESRD patients choosing a home dialysis modality over traditional in-center dialysis is growing. So I'm really excited to hear you share your expertise on what's trending as it relates to this topic. I think uh, before we dive into some of the questions around trends in the home hemo world or home uh, dialysis world, uh, can you start off by providing our audience with a quick overview of the two different types of home dialysis modalities and talk about why patients would choose one over the other when it comes to deciding on a modality that fits for them? Absolutely. First off, thank you for having me and thank you for the focus on home dialysis. It's an incredibly important topic. And I would love to just kind of introduce the two home modalities, which are home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And so home hemodialysis kind of uses similar principles to in-center hemodialysis. And with in-center hemodialysis, I think first you got to back up to what your kidneys do. Your kidneys filter your blood. If you drink, say, 20 ounces of Coca-Cola that has some potassium, some sodium, it has a lot of glucose, it has some fluid and your kidneys will get rid of what your body doesn't need and hold on to what your body does, and particularly for the liquid-bound waste. Dialysis is trying to do the same thing, and so in in-center hemodialysis, you go to a dialysis unit three times a week, and during those three treatments, we remove blood from the body, we run it through a filter, we take a fluid and run it on the opposite side of that blood, and we use diffusion and a little bit of convection to remove toxins. Home hemodialysis works the exact same way. As the name implies, the big difference is where it happens, which is in the home. That said, typically in the U.S., the way it happens in the home is a little bit different because in-center hemodialysis is typically done three times a week for three and a half to four hours, while home hemodialysis is typically done with shorter, more frequent treatments. The benefits of home hemodialysis are really the flexibility, scheduling, and there are some cardiovascular and other benefits, particularly because home hemodialysis is not a one-size-fits-all uh, modality. Home hemodialysis can range from short daily hemodialysis doing six two-hour treatments a week. It could be nocturnal hemodialysis, which could be done three to five times a week. You can even do home hemodialysis in the way that you do conventional hemodialysis, doing three, four-hour treatments a week. So home hemodialysis is really moving the operation into the home. Peritoneal dialysis, on the other hand, uses the lining of your abdomen, the peritoneum, as a natural filter to clean the blood. Interestingly, some of the early research into dialysis used sheep peritoneum as that dialysis membrane. So you could say, historically, these were kind of the same, and they've grown apart. The process for home hemodial for sorry for peritoneal dialysis involves filling your peritoneal cavity with a dialysis solution that's going to absorb those waste products and excess fluid from the blood that passes through the peritoneum, uh, not technically passed through the peritoneum, but the blood that perfuses the peritoneum, and the solution will then be drained and discarded, and then usually replaced several times a day. 
There's two ways you can do this. One is called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, which is done manually throughout the day. And the other is called automated peritoneal dialysis, which is often done at night using a machine. PD, the biggest benefit for it is that it allows more continuous fluid and waste removal. And it can be a bit less complex in terms of equipment compared to home hemodialysis. Both require a strict aseptic technique to avoid infections. The PD modality, tends to be a little bit less burdensome on the patient. And so for a lot of patients, we find that earlier into their dialysis uh, life plan, they will opt for peritoneal dialysis. But what I found is that they're, even though they both occur in the home, they both are very different in terms of your physical appearance as to whether you have a intravascular or intraperitoneal catheter or a fistula versus a catheter and the burden on the patient that oftentimes in terms of which modality is right for whom, I find that if you introduce both modalities, your patient will be able to tell you what's best for them. And at the end of the day, what we're looking to do is increase patient choice. So whichever is best for the patient is the one the patient will pursue. That said, for a lot of patients, this will be one of many modalities. Uh, for many of our patients, they will encounter both of these and more modalities throughout their kind of end-stage kidney disease life. No, that's... Uh... A lot of great points that you share there, Dr. Shaw. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I were, whenever I was uh, seeing patients um, in clinic, you know, we would start talking about dialysis. A lot of them were very familiar with the traditional in-center um, dialysis modality. Either they've had um, friends or family that have gone through that and they know what that looks like and some of them feel comfortable doing that because there are nurses there and technicians there to help if something happens. But I'm just curious, would you sit down and talk to your patients um, and you're introducing the various dialysis modalities? How do you, how do you talk about the home modalities to them? You know, because they're, again, they've, they've heard about in-center dialysis. They don't know, some of them don't even know that you can do this at home. So when you tell them that they can, it's, it's kind of a surprise. But what, what is typically your, your counseling methods with them whenever you initially introduce home dialysis to them? Definitely. So first I tend to start broad and we start early. So this is a difficult discussion to have. And so this is a discussion that you want to have multiple times because you really want to find the right option for your patient. Mm -hmm. And so when I start talking to them about dialysis planning, usually their GFR is around 20 to 25. I opt to take the same time when we're introducing them to transplant because 20 is where they can be listed for a transplant to discuss dialysis planning. And I usually start broad by by saying that there's two big picture ways to do this. One is to go to a dialysis unit three times a week. The other is to do it at home. Mm -hmm. I ask if you have any experience with either of these modalities. Uh, I find actually patients who have had experience with home dialysis, if it is 20 or 30 years ago, things don't really look the way they did back then. So for a lot of patients who have remote experience with home dialysis through a friend or family member, they're actually the ones who are more surprised by what home dialysis looks like in the 21st century. And so first I start by just trying to gauge where someone is coming to me from in terms of their knowledge. And then what I try to do is I try to approach, I try to offer both as true equals. And I try to highlight that the benefit of being at home is the flexibility, the quality of life that it can bring you. The benefit of being in center is the ability to have someone else perform your treatments. Yeah. And I find for a lot of patients, they're very clear within one to two hours of exactly what they would want. The more, uh, and oftentimes these are things that I could tell from having taken care of a patient in the past, how uh, engaged they have been in their care, how much they've been interested in providing their own data points, things like home blood pressure monitoring, home weight monitoring, mm -hmm. how interested they are in uh, kind of a collaborative relationship versus there are patients who say, I just want you to tell me what to do and I want it to get done. So I find that kind of looking at how our patient relationship has developed and then introducing both. Uh, we usually will have our patients go through a cascade of education, starting with me, then going to a nurse educator, and then going to a dialysis unit where they will see both in-center and home. That's so they, it's a, it's a process. 
but yeah. going on dialysis is a process. And so I think there's there's no quick and easy way here. Uh, but the the kind of long and short of it is it's a iterative process of offering more information. And at yeah. the end of the day, what I want is the best modality for my patient. And yep. for each individual patient, it could be home, it could be in center, it could be neither, it could be conservative care. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, patients didn't have as much information as they have today, you know, at their fingertips to look at the different types of modalities that are out there. So there's a lot more education being done, you know, especially as, as you're saying, you've got a nurse educator that works with you. And it's a multi-step process to actually make that decision as a, for the patient, empower the patient to make the decision um, that's best for them as it relates. Because this is a this is a big decision to make for them, right? And and for some reason, if they decide they want to do home hemo or peritoneal dialysis, they start it, it doesn't work out for them. They can always switch to in-center dialysis and also vice versa, right? Absolutely. I think that's a really important point. And it's one thing that I also try to emphasize that this feels like such a huge decision, but it's not a final decision. Uh, if you choose to do home dialysis and the time comes and you say, I don't think I can do this, mm -hmm. in-center is still available to you. If you choose to do home dialysis and you start it and you say, this is not what I thought it was going to be, in-center is still available to you. And the opposite applies as well. So I do try to highlight to patients that they have they have a choice here and they will always have a choice. It's There's no final decisions. Yeah, no, great point. So that leads me to my next question um, around just why home dialysis is gaining momentum in the ESRD patient population. We know that there's, um, there's a lot of different initiatives going on uh, right now, one being the kidney care choice model. Um, and uh, also, you know, we talked to, touched a little bit about this uh, before, but just around patient empowerment. Can you talk a little bit about why home dialysis is gaining more momentum now as opposed to maybe five or 10 years ago? Absolutely. I think the reason that we're seeing an emphasis on home dialysis is because there's been a realization that there are clinical and cost benefits to home dialysis. So for both peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis, for peritoneal dialysis, there's an early mortality benefit. There's a mortality benefit in your first two years compared to in-center hemodialysis. And this is related to preservation of residual kidney function. When you start dialysis, let's say you have a GFR of eight, that GFR is still eight the next day and peritoneal dialysis will protect that. And as good as we as nephrologists are, we are not as good as your kidneys are. So there's an early mortality benefit there. There's quality of life benefits to both modes of home dialysis. And home hemodialysis has a bevy of benefits to cardiovascular disease, blood pressure control, phosphorus control. Diets are less restricted on both dialysis, home dialysis modalities. Fluid removal is more feasible. So there's a lot of benefits. It's also been realized that there are cost savings, although it's not entirely certain if some of these cost savings are related to the fact that historically the healthier patients were offered home dialysis modalities. So I think that there is a there is a realization that there is both a cost and efficacy argument for home dialysis. And the biggest argument is we want our patients to have choice. I think in this country, the government and nephrologists, we we want options for our patients. And historically, we are up to about 13 to 15% home dialysis uh, prevalence right now. Mm -hmm. Historically, we were much lower than those numbers. And I don't think anyone agrees on what the cap could be, but I think most would agree that more than 15% of patients would do well at home and would want to be at home if they had the choice. Yeah. No, those are those are really good points. And uh, I think access is another big thing, right? Like depending on where patients live, you know, do they have access to uh, the home dialysis uh, modalities? You know, are they getting the proper counseling where they're at in rural communities? Maybe they don't have as much of the education that around home dialysis. And so, you know, there's um, there's various factors that play into this. Um, now, just a, a little bit about patient empowerment. Um, how do you empower your patients to choose what 
what's the right modality for them as it relates to home dialysis? I think to me, patient empowerment needs to be way upstream from dialysis modality selection. When we're, if by the time we've gotten to deciding a dialysis modality, there are a lot of other steps that hopefully have taken place. And there's a doctor patient relationship that hopefully has had time to develop. And to me, patient empowerment really occurs upstream. It's things like giving your patient the choice of nephrologists. It's mm -hmm. recognizing that not everyone will see eye to eye. It's giving them it's giving them choices throughout all of their care so that the choice of modality is just one more choice that they're given. And I think patient empowerment to me really comes back to kind of shared decision making. To me, patient empowerment is instead of me telling you what to do, it's me telling you this is what our options are. This is where literature may support one over the other. But if your leaning is towards the other, then we can talk about the nitty gritty and we can talk about uh, whether that's appropriate for you. But it's really, it's it's kind of, I, to me, patient empowerment is kind of patient education. Mm -hmm. And then allowing myself to take a step back and say, we're going to do what's best for you. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I love what you said about just sheer decision making. You know, it's not just the patient involved. It's it's their family members, right, that may be caring for them. Um, it's you, the provider. It's the nurses that are also a part of their care. It's uh, the dietitian that's also involved in managing um, all their uh, nutrition needs. And so there's mo multiple people involved and it's, it is that it is that whole group effort that brings everything together and, and just laying the options out there. I think that's the biggest thing. And a lot of times that doesn't happen, right? That, that aspect of, hey, you've got options. You have, you know, three different modalities you can choose from here. And, and this is what each one entails. And some patients, unfortunately, don't get to hear that, right? And some patients don't know what questions to ask and that's completely understandable they didn't go you know to medical school to learn all that stuff so it's it's our responsibility as healthcare providers to educate them but also at the same time tell them this is your choice and this is your family member's choice but we uh, are here to to help you make that decision and so it truly is shared decision making um, I'll go into my next question here. And, uh, you know, in March of 2020, the world changed completely when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global health emergency. Everything changed for everyone after that, especially healthcare workers. There were a lot of lessons learned during this period about how we manage patients, especially those with ESRD. Uh, can you share with us a little about how the pandemic changed the landscape of home dialysis overall and, and possibly even served as a catalyst for uptake in home dialysis for patients with ESRD? Absolutely. I, I think that's almost an understatement. The world really did change for everyone, particularly healthcare workers. And I think in terms of discussing the impact of the pandemic on home dialysis, the first thing you have to talk about is in-center hemodialysis. Mm -hmm. And the for the first time in many years, possibly since the beginning of the Medicare uh, ESKD program, we saw a reduction in the size of the in-center population. And this is because when we were early in the pandemic, before we had therapeutics, before we had vaccines, we were advising people to socially isolate. And the one population that really could not was the population that had to cohort three times a week in a dialysis unit. The experience for a lot of these dialysis patients was brutal as well as patients who were hospitalized, patients who were in skilled nursing facilities. They were exposed to really difficult uh, policies that they really had to endure. And the home dialysis patients were largely spared from a lot of this, including that early excess mortality. So for a lot of our patients, they were scared of going to a dialysis unit, and it prompted an interest in home dialysis in those who maybe did not have an interest in it before. Mm -hmm. Another thing that happened was we started to have supply chain challenges in in-center hemodialysis. Early in this pandemic, we were all worried about lack of ventilators, 
And one of the things that we actually did run into limitations on was in-center hemodialysis machines, particularly in hospitals. And so you started to see an increase in the acute use of peritoneal dialysis as hospitals that no longer had uh, available hemodialysis machines, nurses, CRRT machines, still needed to treat COVID-associated kidney failure. And so you started to see an increase in an interest in home effects on in-center hemo. You also saw other trends, increases in telehealth uh, that may have helped bring more education to those who are not able to get it. You had talked earlier about access to uh, home dialysis. One of the things I think is underappreciated is access to in-center hemodialysis. If you have a two-hour uh, commute to your nearest dialysis unit, that's four hours round trip three times a week. That's a patient who really would benefit from home dialysis. Yeah, and I wonder sure. if the increase in telehealth helped bring more education to that patient who may have also had a two-hour commute to their nephrologist and maybe was, would not have been able to take advantage of all the educational opportunities available. Uh, so you had a lot of forces pushing in different directions, uh, but each of those directions seemed to favor home dialysis. Yeah, no, those are all those are all very great points. And, you know, I love that you brought up telehealth because um, there weren't many practitioners that were using telehealth in the, in the nephrology world prior to the pandemic. However, once uh, the pandemic hit, they really had no choice but to adopt this form of seeing patients. And I think there was a lot of skepticism at the beginning, right, around using telehealth and how we're going to perform, you know, exams this way. And, you know, are we going to be able to get the information we, we need? Is it going to work? And I guess what they found out was it did work and it was efficient and if and it was effective. And not just in the outpatient CKD patient population, but also uh, for the dialysis patients, whether they were home patients or whether they were uh, in center dialysis patients, there were, you know, there were ways to actually see these patients. And to your point, you save time. And with that, you potentially have more time to spend with the patient and better educate them. Is that what you found in your practice? I think so. I think that so I, I practice in a very small state that is yeah, right. a little insulated from some of the issues of geographic distance. Mm -hmm. But there were definitely patients who, uh, if they were not able to make it to the clinic, now all of a sudden we had a backup option to say, hey, why don't we just schedule a FaceTime or a virtual meeting? And yeah. so it allowed us to capture some of the patients who were either afraid to come in or who could not come in. So it definitely yeah. did bring back that opportunity. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. Um, I remember uh, eight to 10 years ago, again, when I started in practice in a nephrology, uh, you know, uh, private practice, we, we did have the option of seeing patients through telemedicine. However, we were using technology back then that wasn't so great. Of course, now in a little under a decade, you know, there's a little, been a lot of technological advancements as it relates to seeing people, you know, uh, in rural communities and, you know, of course, internet connections a lot better as well. So there's a lot of use for this, a lot of utility. And I think uh, there's, I think this will continue as far as the use of telemedicine goes. So uh, it's great to see those advancements. Um, Absolutely. There has been a bit of a growth of a new disparity, though, that I've seen, which some of my uh -huh. elderly patients, kind of less tech savvy patients, have found that as much of the world went virtual, it was a yeah. struggle for them. So I, I think it is important to be thoughtful of as we break down certain disparities, are we re are we building up other ones? And yeah. so uh, there we we had a lot of. Uh, interventions that we made to try to help improve the tech literacy of some of our uh, less confident patients. And eventually we realized that maybe we need to find a happy medium of moving to a medium that was comfortable to them, which in many cases was just a simple telephone. Yeah, absolutely. There are options. There are other options as well. So great point. Um, that takes me to my next question around uh, just the gap that still exists between in-center dialysis and home dialysis. And we know there's still a significant gap that exists. How do we close the gap 
And what is your vision for the future of home dialysis care delivery? Absolutely. So I think in terms of how we close the gap, the number one thing I would say, and uh, I guess I should also say thank you to Nephew for this is education. And I appreciate the content being put forward to help educate. And I would say education of two groups of physicians and care providers and patients. There's a lot of literature that shows that when patients are educated about dialysis modalities, they're more likely to pick home dialysis. And at the end of the day, we don't want to remove choice. We don't want to force people onto home. We want to increase choice. And so we're not looking for 80%, 100% home dialysis. We're just looking for everyone to have the choice of the type of dialysis that's right for them. Yeah. And then the other half is physician education. If you look at recent surveys of graduating nephrology fellows, the number one thing that they feel uncomfortable with is home hemodialysis, and number two is peritoneal dialysis. And so those fellows, they're, they're today's attendings. If they're not comfortable with it, they're not going to be comfortable prescribing it. They're not going to be comfortable educating their patients on it. And as today's attendings, they're also today's teachers. They're not going to be comfortable teaching tomorrow's graduates about it. So we we have a huge educational gap. I think there are other reasons as well. But I think to me, the largest place that needs to be fixed is education of both providers and patients. And I think that if we can close that gap, then I think all of the other issues that some people describe, there are some fiscal uh, and policy uh, things that we would like to see, like assisted home dialysis. But I think those will all come with time. I think the biggest thing we need is we need we need every graduating nephrology fellow in the U.S. to feel comfortable taking care of home dialysis patients and educating home dialysis patients. When that happens, then we will see a revolution. Well, those are those are real strong words, and uh, I can't agree with you more. Um, I think that uh, as the next generation of healthcare providers um, come into this healthcare world. Um, you know, hopefully education, um, not just about dialysis, but just in general, continue to improve. And, and I love that, uh, that plan for closing this gap. Um, and so with that, I just want to open it up to you, Dr. Shaw, for any final comments that you have in regards to this topic. Absolutely. I think the, the thing I would say is that if you survey nephrologists, dialysis nurses, nephrology nurses, most of us would select the home modality. And what we want is we want to increase choice. I think there's been a lot of discussion over uh, things like patient selection, who's appropriate for home dialysis. We're not looking to force people onto any modality. We just want people to have choice. And that's that's the goal of all of these endeavors to increase home dialysis. It should really be to increase home dialysis choice and then let patients take it from there. Great. Well, I want to thank Dr. Shaw for joining us today in addressing this important topic on current trends in home dialysis. I want to thank the NEPHU community for joining us today and listening in to another episode. I encourage you to please share our podcast with others who may be interested in these topics so we can increase visibility and get the word out of our podcast channel. Also, don't forget to check out nephew.org for future webinars, podcasts, and events. You can also check us out on our social media platforms using the handle at nephew community. Thanks again, and we look forward to having you tune in next time. <music>